I work at an organization with about 400 employees, which is smaller than most, but for me, straight out of grad school, massive jump. And every quarter or so, we have what we call an all staff meeting, where all the staff from all over come to one location and we have a meeting. And I was excited for my first all staff until I walked in to my first all staff, because I walked in and I saw no one that I knew, and it absolutely terrified me. And I kind of laugh when I think about it now, but I can still feel how uncomfortable I was when I take myself back to that moment. So I did what any of us would have done. I faked a phone call and I went to the bathroom to buy some time. And I know I laugh about it now and it's kind of funny to think back, but it was terrifying. It was really uncomfortable. Here I was at 26, 27 years old and this insecurity was coming up out of nowhere because I knew no one. And in that moment, here I was surrounded by so many people, but I felt all alone. And I learned something about myself and about humans in general that day that I'm sure you can relate to. You never outgrow the fear and the discomfort of being lonely. And you never stop caring about knowing you belong. Do you remember learning about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? I probably took some of you guys back to high school or college in that moment. Now, Maslow was a psychologist who developed a theory that a certain set of needs drive human motivation and behavior. And usually these needs are displayed in a pyramid-like fashion. And the idea is that your brain and my brain is concerned with certain needs first, then it moves on to meet others. And so he argued that we have five basic needs. And at the very base, there's physiological needs, like like air and water. Then there's safety needs, you know, personal security. Then after that, there's love and belonging, friendship and connection. Then there's self-esteem needs, respect for oneself. And at the very top, self-actualization, the desire to reach our highest potential. Now, this theory suggests that your brain, to a certain degree, works through these levels. So your brain is constantly scanning whatever environment you find yourself in to make sure these needs get met. Your brain, you'll be happy to know, his primary job is to keep you alive. That's why physiological and safety needs are at the very bottom of the pyramid. But here's what's interesting. Once a need has been met, your brain isn't scanning the environment to make sure that need is met like it was before. No, your brain moves on and scans your environment for the next need. So first, your brain wants to keep you alive but then it wants you to thrive. And after your brain knows that you are physically safe, Maslow's theory suggests what your brain would deem as the next most important thing for you to thrive as a human is love, belonging, and connection. And I'm not a psychologist, obviously, but I buy that. I know I've certainly felt that and feel that in my own life. Right, you know this, like we all expect to feel nervous or lonely on the first day of school or on the first day of a new job, but what happens when you're two years in and you still aren't sure if your coworkers even like you? Or you work next to them in a cubicle every day, but you wonder if they would even talk to you if they knew the real you. Or maybe you're in a season of life that is isolating, you're a stay-at-home parent of young children. And if we're being really honest, for some of us, we've been in that space for so long, we've maybe even started to think, okay, it's us, it's my fault, it must be me, there's something wrong with me, or this is just my reality and I just need to accept my situation. I mean, you know this, the desire to belong, to be connected relationally, to know you have your people and to be known and to know that you're still loved is ingrained into the very fabric of our DNA. To experience loneliness is to be disconnected from what it means to be human. And we are living in a day and age where we are more disconnected than ever before. I mean, studies show that 36% of Americans feel lonely frequently, including 61% of young adults ages 18 to 26 and 51% of mothers with young children. But we've all been there. Maybe you're there right now. There's not much worse than not belonging, feeling invisible or feeling disconnected. And there's a beautiful picture of this in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus has an encounter with someone who found themselves on the outside, not belonging in the religious circle of that day. So I want to pick up in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. 
Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So we learned something about Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector. Tax collectors were hated in the New Testament, right? Not just because they collected taxes, but because they always charged more than what was required. And they were backed by the power of Rome so nobody could tell them not to. So they would charge extra and pocket the rest. Basically, they would be getting rich off of their own people. They were sellouts of the worst kind. And Zacchaeus is a chief of them. He's the boss of them. Watch this, Luke tells us something fascinating. He, Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. So here's Zacchaeus, wee little Zacchaeus, if you grew up in church, he shows no shame. The man climbs a tree. Insecurity doesn't matter. He didn't care what people thought. He just wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus because he'd heard about him. He, Jesus' reputation preceded him everywhere that he went. And Zacchaeus, he'd heard about the miracles, the teachings, and the kindness. He'd heard that this rabbi was just different. There was something so irresistible about Jesus. Even the worst of the worst, the ones that were hated the most, the ones on the outside, the ones that did not belong, they could not wait to even catch a glimpse. So here Zacchaeus is, get a picture of this in your head. He's in a tree. And his only expectation is to see Jesus as he walked by, maybe see what brand sandals and tunic this legendary rabbi was wearing. But what happens next is shocking to Zacchaeus and every onlooker watching. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. And I don't know if anyone in that moment could have expected such a turn of events. Don't miss this. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but then the unthinkable happens. Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And Jesus didn't just look at Zacchaeus. No, no, Jesus sees him. The difference between looking at and seeing is the difference between hearing and listening. If, if you've got a roommate or you're in a relationship or you've ever been married, like you understand the difference. You can hear without engaging, but to listen is to engage intentionally. To see someone is to intentionally engage with them. To see someone is to initiate relationship. To see someone is to care. To see someone is to love. And Jesus could have just looked and kept on moving, and no one, including Zacchaeus, would have given it a second thought. But Jesus sees him. In fact, he sees all of them. He knows who he's dealing with. He knows all the bad that Zacchaeus has done, the money that is stole, the reputation that he's on the outside, but that doesn't stop Jesus from inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house for a meal. And, And this is so lost on us, but to share a meal with someone in the first century at their house was so intimate. In fact, the principle that was often at play was this, to share a meal is to share a life. To share a meal at someone's house meant connection, acceptance, and an identity between friends. Social values and hierarchical boundaries controlled such occasions. And Jesus, with an invitation, challenges the social stability of the day. And we can now begin to understand why this invitation was so polarizing. Zacchaeus, blown away. He's doing backflips on the inside. He cannot believe that Jesus wants to spend time with him at his house. But the onlookers, disgusted, because this was not normal. This was not customary. This was frowned upon. People like Jesus did not build relationships with people like Zacchaeus. And people like Zacchaeus did not belong with people like Jesus. Or so they thought. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. In the first century religious context where everyone was looking to draw a line in the sand as to who belonged in the family of God, Jesus wanted to make it abundantly clear that the invitation to belong was for everyone. Jesus declares that Zacchaeus was now a part of the family, the one that found himself on the outside, the one that wondered if he could ever be loved, if, if he could ever experience life-changing, meaningful connection, 
suddenly felt connected. And the irony in the story is that Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost, but when this interaction ends, the only people still lost are the religious ones that cannot believe Jesus would be the guest of Zacchaeus. Jesus came to make a way for everyone to belong in the family of God. Jesus' goal wasn't just to gather crowds. His goal was to grow a family. And you and I were created for love and belonging. I think it's why loneliness is so unnatural to us because it goes against our genetic makeup as humans. So if that's where you find yourself today, feeling lonely, feeling like you're not important to anyone, feeling like nobody sees you, feeling like it would be safer to stay alone so that you can't get rejected, feeling like you can't experience meaningful relationships, or feeling alone even though you're surrounded by so many, no matter where you find yourself today, whether you're a person of faith or someone following Jesus, or maybe you're just curious, I want you to know that Jesus sees you. He saw Zacchaeus and he sees you. And Jesus sees all of you. He knows the story, the struggle, and even the secrets. He sees all of you. He's afraid of no part of you. And just like Zacchaeus, he invites you in. He invites you to belong even before you believe. Because Jesus didn't come to offer us a religion. No, no, it's better than that. He came to offer us a relationship. And Jesus didn't see Zacchaeus because he gave back all the money that he stole. No, no, don't miss this. Before Zacchaeus did anything, Jesus pursued him. Before Zacchaeus committed to changing anything in his life, Jesus saw him. Before Zacchaeus gave back any money that he stole, Jesus sought to build a relationship with him. Jesus told Zacchaeus, you can belong with me even before you believe in me. The catalyst for the new direction of Zacchaeus' life Jesus saw him. Jesus was kind to him. Jesus sought him out because Jesus came to earth on a mission to seek and to save those who were lost to him. In that day, Zacchaeus' trajectory changed forever because he finally believed that he belonged. And it changed the way that he saw himself. It ultimately changed the way that he lived. So here is a guy who could not have been more alone who has lived probably most of his adult life isolated with no real human connection other than with those who could get rich working for him. Then Jesus sees him. And it was that acceptance, that moment with Jesus that inspired Zacchaeus. And suddenly his next steps became clear. And as rich as Zacchaeus was, I bet if he were here talking to us today, he would tell us that day, his life became a lot richer. Finally, Zacchaeus was able to thrive. And we don't know how the story ends and what happened after Jesus moved on, but I can guarantee you the meal that Jesus had with him wasn't the last time Zacchaeus had people over at his house for dinner. Truth is, Jesus sees you. So a question that I think is worth wrestling with, if Jesus really sees you, where would that lead you? For all of us, it's going to look a little bit different, but what that means for all of us at the baseline level is that knowing Jesus sees us allows us to live with a confidence, security, and a courage that would be fleeting without him. We can live free from the fear of rejection because Jesus sees all of us and brings us close, offers us grace, and makes space at the table for us anyway. Jesus sees you which will change the way that we see ourselves and will eventually change the way that we see others. But the starting point for all of us is living with the confidence and the hope that Jesus sees us. Loneliness disconnects us from what it means to be human because we were created to experience love and belonging. But thankfully, Jesus came to make a way for everyone to belong. I know this is a big idea and this hits all of us differently as we're finding out where we are on our journey. But what I'd love for you to consider is to check out the description below to figure out your next best step.